Welcome back to the Maritime History Podcast, everyone. I'm your host, Brandon Hubner, and today we're moving on to episode number seven, Old Kingdom Egypt Expands Its Reach. Quickly, before we jump in, just another reminder that images and links to further reading on the artifacts and items in today's episode are available on the show's main page, MaritimeHistoryPodcast.com. I know that we podcast listeners tend to listen on the go, which really is one of the great things about podcasts as a medium, if you ask me, but one of the downsides is that you lose the visual element of history. For me, putting images with descriptions is enormously helpful when I'm trying to get a grip on something new. So if you're the same way, take just a minute to stop by the website and see exactly what it is that we're talking about from time to time. To switch gears, I hope you enjoyed last episode's look into some of the story and theory behind the magnificent Khufu ship. Unfortunately, I skipped over quite a bit of the Egyptian political development to get us to that point, and as we're focused on maritime history here, I don't really want to get too bogged down in such matters. If you want to get more context in which to place our discussion, I'd highly recommend Rob Monaco's Podcast History of Our World for a succinct six-episode jaunt through Egyptian history. But if you feel more like pulling out the magnifying glass and looking at Egyptian history in more detail, then there's the marvelous Egyptian History Podcast by Dominic Perry, dedicated purely to looking at Egyptian history. Today's episode is going to focus on the 5th and 6th dynasties when Egypt began to really expand its long-distance trade after the pyramid-building campaigns of the 4th dynasty pharaohs like Khufu. Although, as we'll see, recently discovered evidence suggests that Khufu was connected to an Egyptian seaport on the coast of the Suez Gulf. I'll do my best to lay down a skeletal timeline to provide some context for our discussion, and to at least attempt to make this an interesting story rather than a list of facts and names. So, with all that business out of the way, let's get into today's material. We'll start with a somewhat pedestrian topic that's still a bit interesting, that is, a few Old Kingdom representations of ships being built. A very interesting depiction comes from the tomb of a 5th dynasty pharaoh named Ptah Hotep, where we can see workmen busy building a series of papyrus reed boats. Some of the workmen are busy cutting the papyrus, which is used to make cordage, while others are using their outstretched feet as a lever to bend the ends of the papyrus reeds back towards the middle of the boat. They then take the cordage cut by their fellow workers and use it to tie off the ends and give the papyrus boats their distinctive shape, one which we saw was mirrored in the style of some wooden plank ships like the Khufu ship. Numerous depictions in tombs around Egypt, and throughout the entire Egyptian history I might add, show the basic uses to which papyrus boats were put. Mainly, these uses included hunting and fishing, as there are many tomb depictions where we can see Egyptians afloat on papyrus boats, either with their spears poised to kill a hippo, or their nets and hooked fishing lines in the water as the fish compete to see who gets cooked first. Eventually, as we've seen, The Egyptians were among the earliest people to make the transition to wooden, planked ships, though the transition was certainly a loose one, as Egyptians still use papyrus boats to traverse the Nile today. Rather, once they began building wooden boats and ships, they were able to travel longer distances, in addition to being able to utilize and refine the sail as a method of propulsion. In the same 5th dynasty tomb where we find the depiction of hippo hunters, we find a fascinating scene carved in relief, depicting around 20 men hard at work cutting the planks for a wooden ship and then assembling the hull of the ship. It's pretty safe to assume that the ships they're building are large, since one ship shows nine men inside of it, hammering strakes onto what we assume to be the tenon joints that were commonly used as joints by Egyptian shipbuilders. 
Since the ships are only at a stage where their hulls are being built, we can't really know whether they had sails in the end, but we do know that Egyptians used sails stretching back into the pre-dynastic period, as we saw on the Gerzian jar from episode 5. So it wouldn't at all be a surprise to find out that the wooden ships were eventually outfitted with sails before being pushed into the Nile. The sail itself, as we've seen, probably owed its first invention to the fact that the flow of the Nile and the direction of the predominant winds in Egypt complemented one another perfectly, so that a sailor could use a steady northerly tailwind to make his way back up the Nile from the Mediterranean. The early development of the sail in Egypt tells an interesting story of technological innovation and how certain technologies are sometimes retained through custom, even after the original reason for using that technology is no longer around. If we start from the assumption that the earliest of boats on the Nile were the papyrus reed boats, which comprise the earliest depictions, then we have to realize that a single pole mast in a reed boat would end up giving you a problem. Even though the sail was a great way to decrease travel time and make transportation on the Nile more efficient, it was apparent to the Egyptians early on that a single pole mast secured in the center of a reed boat would effectively punch a hole through the reeds and defeat the entire purpose of outfitting the boat with a sail. The obvious solution, and the one which they adopted, probably early on, was to split the mast into two poles which shared the weight equally. By planting these poles in the thicker outside bundles of the reed boat, the rupture problem was solved. But once Egypt transitioned to using wooden ships for their long-distance travel, the bipod mast was no longer necessary. Wooden ships could support the weight and force of a single pole mast in the center of the ship. So, beginning in the 5th dynasty and continuing until the Middle Kingdom, we see the gradual disappearance of the bipod mast and the emergence of the single pole mast with increasingly complex rigging. The gradual addition of braces to help trim the sail, when taken in conjunction with numerous different sail configurations, leads us to the conclusion that the 5th and 6th dynasties were periods of experimentation for Egyptian sailors. This is a natural conclusion, though, but before it becomes obvious to us, we first need to meet the pharaoh who presided over what many view as the pinnacle of Egypt's political and cultural influence during the Old Kingdom period. Sahure is remembered as the pharaoh who oversaw the expansion of Egyptian trade and foreign relations in the Old Kingdom. The experimentation with sales makes more sense, then, when we look at it from the perspective of a 5th dynasty Egyptian sailor, or even from the perspective of Sahure himself. Quicker travel time equals more trade and more revenue for the monarch so it's quite understandable that many sailors would experiment with their sail configurations to try and reach the most beneficial setup to harness the power of the wind. Before I get too far ahead of myself, though, it's important to realize that even though long-distance sea trade may have increased under Sahore, it definitely existed in some form, at least as early as Khufu, though we aren't completely aware of the scope. Our proof of this early sea trade comes from a site that was originally discovered in the 19th century, but it wasn't examined in detail until the 21st century. At first, an explorer discovered galleries hewn into the rock at a site named Wadi El Jarf, located several miles from the modern coast of the Suez Gulf. He assumed that these galleries were catacombs of some sort, and the site was largely forgotten until the 1950s, when a French team again examined the site without fully realizing its significance. Then, in 2011, French archaeologist Pierre Talley began a detailed look at Wadi El Jarf and came to the conclusion that it was actually an old kingdom harbor of sorts, used for sea travel and storage. Over 30 galleries were discovered, their sizes averaging out to around 65 feet long, 10 feet wide, and 7 feet high. 
Each gallery was situated so that it could be sealed shut with an enormous stone block, presumably to protect the contents that were stored inside. Those contents are what tell us that this site likely served as a dry ground harbor for the expeditions of Old Kingdom pharaohs, including Khufu, whose cartouche was inscribed on several of the massive stone seals. Inside the galleries, archaeologists found numerous fragments of what could only be objects from Egyptian ships. Rope fragments, whole tenons of acacia wood, an entire plank of a boat timber, and fragments of boat oars. Although the galleries were probably too small to house complete ships, as we saw in our look at the Khufu ship, Egyptian construction techniques relied on the fact that ships could be easily disassembled into their composite pieces, either for transport or for storage. So the belief is that these galleries were used to store disassembled ships and the goods that they were transporting as numerous storage jars have also been discovered in the galleries. The last evidence at Wadi El Jarf that really rounds out the theory that it was a port comes in the form of limestone anchors, found both in the galleries and on the seafloor adjacent to the galleries. Over 20 of these hewn anchors have been found, varying in both shape and size, but unmistakable in their use as anchors for the Egyptian ships of old. So, all of that about Wadi al Jarf to say that Egypt was conducting sea trade on the Red Sea to the east at least as early as Khufu. Even before Khufu, Sneferu was conducting trade to the north and then to the Levant, but when Sahure took the throne in the 5th dynasty, he would oversee the expansion of trade in both directions. As would be expected, Sahure continued the Egyptian maritime connection with the Levant to the north. The oldest definitive Egyptian inscriptions of seagoing ships come from Sahure's pyramid complex in Abusir. Inscriptions on both sides of a wall at Abusir show the moments of departure and return for an Egyptian voyage north to Syria. Although the inscriptions only show four ships departing, and eight ships returning, it's from the people on board the returning ships that we get our best glimpse of why the voyage was undertaken. The four departing ships are manned entirely by Egyptian crewmen. In contrast, the eight returning ships contain both Egyptian crewmen and bearded Syrian prisoners depicted as bowing down to the Egyptian pharaoh. To be precise, the prisoners can only be called Syro-Canaanites, but the main point still applies. Sahure's ships in this inscription give us our oldest clear evidence of Egyptian ships making a sea voyage to interact with another culture. In addition, it's fairly safe to assume that Sahure's voyage to Syria was not made on amicable terms, since the Syrians here are depicted as prisoners, forced to pay obeisance to the pharaoh. As for the mechanics of the ships from Sahure's pyramid complex, they seem to follow the same basic idea as the wooden Khufu ship, even if they show several additions of improved technology. For instance, they were definitely outfitted with the bipod mast structure discussed earlier, as it was still used during the 5th dynasty. In the second scene depicting the return voyage, the masts themselves are lowered, resting inside crutch-like supports near one end of the ship, a practice that was apparently common when the sails weren't in use. Another technological improvement on the Suhure ships is the use of a hogging truss, which was a support feature necessary on Egyptian ships. To explain briefly, since Egyptian ships lacked both internal frames and the structural support provided by a keel, they quickly discovered that the forces exerted by sea-strength waves upon a loaded ship would cause the ship to hog, an unintuitive term that means this. When a loaded Egyptian ship would crest a high wave, and keep in mind that these ships were fairly large, 150 feet long in some cases, the extreme ends of the ship would actually sag down as the crest of the wave supported the center of the ship's hull, 
In extreme cases, the ship would hog into two pieces, the downward force of the load and the upward force of the wave, causing the ship to essentially snap in half. To counter this phenomena, the hogging truss would provide the necessary force to keep the ship's extreme ends from sagging. In its simplest form, cable girdles were attached around both the bow end and the stern end of the hull. Then, a long cable running the length of the hull along the deck would be attached at either end to the girdles and raised well above the deck level by a series of forked stanchions. To achieve the desired tension, a stick was thrust between the cable strands near the center of the cable's length and twisted to increase or decrease the tension on the hull as needed. Problem solved. The hogging truss became a common part of Egyptian seagoing ships, as is shown by another 5th dynasty depiction from the Pyramid Causeway of Unas, the last pharaoh of the 5th dynasty. This depiction of a sailing ship on the causeway wall of Unas's pyramid complex at Saqqara shows us that still, about a hundred years after Sahure sat on the throne, Egyptian ships were making trips to the Levant and returning with Syro Canaanite prisoners. Again, the ship makes use of a hogging truss to ensure its seaworthiness, and in place of the bipod mast, there is a tripod mast. Unas reigned at the end of the 5th dynasty, a period that was roughly concurrent with the rise of Sargon and his Akkadian empire in Mesopotamia. It's one of the intriguing coincidences of history that both the Old Kingdom of Egypt and the Akkadian empire came to their separate ends at about the same time. But before we get to the demise of the Old Kingdom, and a bit of an explanation about why it ended at the same time as Sargon's empire, Let's take a look at one more maritime topic that's actually one of the continuing mysteries focused on by maritime historians and Egyptologists alike. When we think about ancient mysteries, we tend to think in terms of what a certain object was used for, how an ancient culture could have built a particular structure, or why they did things the way they did. This particular ancient Egyptian maritime mystery is something else altogether. The Palermo Stone first introduces us to the land of Punt, when it says that during the reign of Sahure, Egyptian ships returned from Punt, laden with 80,000 measures of myrrh for use in temple rituals, 6,000 measures of the natural metal alloy electrum, and 23,000 wooden logs. The problem that's left us with a historical mystery to this day is that there is little to no revelation in Egyptian texts about where Punt was, how the Egyptians went about getting there, or how long the journey took. In several texts, the land of Punt is referred to as ta Netjer, which isn't really helpful either, since it literally means the land of the gods, or God's land. If you don't mind my condensing a several hundred year ongoing debate into the basics, the general consensus is that the land of Punt likely lays somewhere to the southeast of Egypt. The debate continues as to whether it was purely within the confines of the Red Sea, along the coast of modern-day Ethiopia, or whether it extended out into the Gulf of Aden, or possibly even around the Horn of Africa and even further along Africa's eastern coast. Our best evidence, though, comes purely from the goods which returning voyagers commemorated as having come from Punt. We also have evidence of multiple voyages to Punt in the Old Kingdom period, starting with Sahure, but also commissioned by the 5th dynasty pharaoh Jedkara Isesi, who is also known to have made expeditions north and into Byblos in Syria, as was probably common for Old Kingdom pharaohs after the 4th dynasty. The only mention of Jedkara Isesi's expedition to Punt comes from a letter that was written by Pepi II over 100 years later. The letter was addressed to Harkuf, the chief of the scouts under both Pepi II and his predecessor Merenra. The transition from the 5th dynasty to the 6th dynasty over that 100-year period saw a marked shift in the focus of the pharaohs and the source of their fears. 
where for hundreds of years they had little worry about the security of their rule, Pepi I, Marenra, and then Pepi II witnessed a shift in the attitudes of Egypt's southern neighbors, a people they commonly referred to as the Nubians. The Nubians had been conquered early on in Egypt's history, and had paid tribute to the pharaohs for a long time. But beginning in the 6th dynasty, the pharaohs started sending scouts south, deep into Nubian land, to survey the political climate and report back. It's in this context that the story of Harkuf first comes into play. His story is inscribed outside his tomb, on the west bank of the Nile near Aswan, in Upper Egypt. From this inscription, we're told how on orders of the pharaoh Merenra, Harkuf made an epic journey far up the Nile to the land of Yam, a place beyond Egypt's control. He returned to Egypt, bringing both exotic goods and word that the political situation in Nubia was growing dire. Such news resulted in his being sent on a second mission south, where he again scoped out the land and sent back word that the Nubian people were growing restless and discussing the possibility of throwing off their Egyptian oppressors. Another return, and a third journey to Yam only shed further light on the reality that the politics of Nubia had shifted, and that Upper Egypt would do well to pay heed. Before Harkov returned from his third journey, however, Marenra died, and Pepi II took his place on the throne. At six years old, Pepi was certainly unfit to serve as king, but his advisors attempted to maintain the order of things by sending Harkov on a fourth journey. The tenor of this journey changed, though, from the intel-gathering missions that Harkov had undertaken for Marenra to a more standard trade mission to gather tribute for the new pharaoh. Even as Nubia began to plan an uprising, Harkov traveled the land, gathering exotic goods to showcase Egypt's authority over Nubia, an act that Wilkinson likens to Nero's apocryphal fiddling as Rome burned. This whole story connects back to maritime history here, in the following inscription from Harkov's tomb that commemorates what he obviously felt was the honor of receiving a letter from the boyhood pharaoh. In response to a letter which he'd received from Harkov, Pepi II replied with the following, I have noted the matter of your letter, which you sent to the king, to the palace, in order that one might know that you had descended in safety from Yam with the army which was with you. You said in your letter that you had brought all great and beautiful gifts, which Hathor, mistress of Emu, hath given to the Ka of the king of Upper and Lower Egypt, Neferkara, who liveth for ever and ever. You said in your letter that you brought a dancing pygmy of the god from the land of the spirits, like the pygmy which the treasurer of the god Birded brought from Punt in the time of Isesi. You said to my majesty, never before has one like him been brought by any other who has visited Yam. Pepe concluded his letter with what can only be seen as the impatience of a child waiting for his latest toy. Come northward to the residence immediately. Hurry and bring this pygmy with you to delight the heart of the dual king Neferkara, who lives forever. When he goes down with you into the ship, Appoint excellent people to be around him on both sides of the ship, lest he fall into the water. When he lies down at night, appoint excellent people to lie around him in his hammock. Inspect ten times per night. My majesty wants to see this pygmy more than the tribute of the Sinai and Punt. This story of Harkov, the chief scout, Pepi, the boy pharaoh, and the fascination with a Nubian pygmy tells us a few things. 1. Egypt definitely had maritime ties far south into Africa and far north into the Levant, at the least. We'll see in future episodes how more detail from a New Kingdom site can help shed a bit more light on where exactly the land of Punt was. But for now, it suffices to say that it was probably to Egypt's southeast and accessible by sea via the Red Sea and beyond.
The other thing that Harkov's story tells us is a bit more unfortunate, but it's a reality of history. As he made these expeditions into Nubia, some by land and some by sea, he kept sending back warnings about the state of politics in Nubia and the danger it posed to Egypt's power. By and large, these warnings went unheeded, especially after Pepi II took the throne. Centuries of overreach by the central Egyptian rulers and their leeching of resources to support their vast mortuary cults and temples led to the Egyptian government becoming weak. Internal weaknesses, the rise of regional power bases, the threat posed by Nubian solidification, and an untimely drought in the 22nd century BC led to a rapid decline of Egyptian power. The boy, Pepi II, reigned for almost eight decades until he was an old man. But instead of bringing stability, his weakness as a ruler, weakness that persisted for years, only contributed to Egypt's decline. By the time of Pepi's death, Egypt had entered the first intermediate period, a time that was nearly in line with the collapse of the Akkadian Empire and the Gutian Interlude a transition that's also been connected to the drought that led to Egypt's decline. Little evidence of maritime trade has been taken from the first intermediate period, so as we wrap up this episode, we'll say goodbye to the Old Kingdom and all that came with it. I hope you'll join us next time as we move forward to consider maritime history and evidence from the Middle Kingdom. For now, though, that does it for Episode 7. If you enjoyed the episode or have questions or thoughts about something in addition to what we've been discussing, stop by the website and shoot me an email, or connect with the community on Facebook, Twitter, or Tumblr. I look forward to hearing from you. Until next time, thanks for listening to the Maritime History Podcast.